You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Good morning. Please turn with me to Zephaniah chapter 2, starting verse 4. Zephaniah chapter 2, starting in verse 4. For Gaza shall be deserted, and Ashkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to you, inhabitants of the seacoast, you nations of the Cherethites! The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. And I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. And you, O seacoast, shall be pastures with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, of which they shall graze. And in the houses of Ashkelon, they shall lie down at evening, for the Lord their God will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes." I have heard the taunts of Moab and the revilings of the Ammonites, how they have taunted my people and made boasts against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab shall become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a land possessed by nettles and salt pits and a waste forever. The remnant of my people shall plunder them and the survivors of my nations shall possess them. This shall be their lot in return for their pride, because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome against them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and to him shall bow down, each in its place, all the lands of the nations. You also, O Cushites, shall be slain by my sword, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he will make Nineveh desolation a dry waste like the desert. Herds shall lie down in her midst, all kinds of beasts, even the owl and the hedgehog shall lodge in her capitals. A voice shall hoot in the window. Devastation will be on the threshold, for her cedar work will be laid bare. This is the exultant city that lived securely, that said in her heart, I am, and there is no one else. What a desolation she has become, a lair for wild beasts. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. And this is the word of the Lord. You all can be seated and children can be dismissed to their classes. Solid work, Rick. Solid work. Hey, all. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks so much for investing your morning with us. Um, do you remember the first time that you saw Ralphie in A Christmas Story on that white wintry day, like, go red and just unload on that bully, and he pushed him down, and he just started hitting him? And the bully had that Daniel Boone hat on, he was really frustrating throughout the entire movie, but, like, Ralphie, uh, what, what gets him to that point is he's, he's uh, a traditional nerdy type, and he's walking along, and he gets hit in the face with a, a snowball, and, and then you have the, the bully, and then his little sidekick guy um, begin to taunt, and, and I love this. This is what a great line, if you're looking for like just words that hurt. Like, do you want a snowball sandwich? That's what he asked. It's like, dude, that is just good. And then he's like, what are you going to do, cry? And then he just makes this really annoying, like, cry, cry, cry. And then Rafi just like, you know, inner monologue, raging. And then he just like goes and he just, he, he's unleashed. And in that moment, if you haven't seen that, you will get a chance sometime in the next month to watch that, probably for 24 hours, if you would like to watch it, just one after the other. Um, in that moment, though, like, you're like, yes. Like, justice served. Like, I don't care who you are. 
I don't care if you're that bully's mom. You're like justice served, right? Um, we know how like the bully narrative goes, and, and we hope that we know how it ends. And look, there are clearly way more serious scenarios and, and way more global scenes and, and whatever, how, how kind of bullies do their work. But bullies do damage, and they cause fear, and they cause anxiety, and they destroy peace and safety and security, and they breed hatred. And sometimes... It, uh, it just seems so tough, and they seem so tough, and so intimidating, and so void of any weakness that it seems like that, that that bully will continue to cause fear and harm forever. And so we might say something like, who could stand against him, right? Uh, we aren't Ralphie strong all the time, and, and we don't always have a defender to stand against the attacks, and so it can be overwhelming at times. The truth is, God's story is filled with scenes and images reflected in those kind of Ralphie rage moments. Uh, Because those kind of cultural tales are really just patterns of human nature put on display. A little more power and a little more downforce and a little more... Uh, maybe a, a few more swirlies and wedgies, and, and on a, a grander scale, a little more abuse and, and a few more victims. And like that's, that's how the, the story goes. And we look back historically, and it's just dark sometimes. And what's crazy is that God's people, as powerful as God is, um, have often suffered as the victim of this type of bullying, followers of Jesus have suffered from the beginning, and that shouldn't surprise us, yet it's still, it's still really tough. Israel got itself into enough trouble. God's people in the Old Testament got itself into enough trouble by like refusing to walk in the ways of the Lord and refusing to walk out their commitment or their covenant with God himself. But but as God's lighthouse, his light to the world, his plan to, to redeem, so far as we saw it in the Old Testament, although that lighthouse was dim at times, it got picked on a lot as, as a nation and, and as a tribe. And I, I heard it once said that the fact that Israel still exists is one of the greatest arguments for the existence of God, right? Now, there's a lot in that, uh, and maybe a lot not in that. But, but the idea is, like, man, if, if that was God's people, like, they just shouldn't be around anymore. And that's true for us as the church as well. And, and you can't just uh, one-to-one interpose those all the time. But we see God's people set in a, in a context of darkness, uh, gathered together as we are today, and scattered abroad. And, and, and sometimes it just feels like, how has the darkness not overcome? How has... Uh, the church not gone away, and, and, and how have we not been defeated? What makes that statement about Israel uh, funny because it's true is that God's people have never been much to look at. No offense. Um, Paul says this in like much more direct terms to the Corinthians. He's like, how many of you are wise or powerful or like of anything worth looking at, right? And they're like, oh gosh, geez, Paul. That's tough, all right? Um, and so uh, I'm merely just transferring words from Scripture, right? Uh, so, so they've just not been much to look at. And so we see this idea of this upside-down kingdom, and it shows up in the old that, that Israel, God's people, set apart to reflect his character and his nature and his glory to the darkness around. Like, and they just look different. It was, it was a matter of contrast. And we see Jesus comes and he begins to like, oh, inaugurate the kingdom. And everyone expected him to come and inaugurate and wear the purple robe and, and ride on the elephant into the city and just wreck house like so many had promised before. And it just didn't look like that, right? It, it's an upside down kingdom. The meek win the day, right? And it's just, it's just not like we would have, have thought. So God's people get pushed around a lot. And, and yet we see things and, and promises and truths like this. God says that he's a mighty fortress. Right? And we see him say that, that his people can find shelter uh, in the, the, the coverage of his wings. 
And we see him say things like, he's the defender of the poor and the brokenhearted. And, and he is mighty to save. But if that's true, it means something for the ones who oppose God and something for the ones who oppose God's people. And it means something for those who are afflicted by the might of this world. God defends and restores the remnant of the household of faith. He does. And that's what we see in this today. And, and so we're looking at Zephaniah at chapter 2 largely. And we're looking at three ways that God defends and restores. And the first one is this. It's a warning to the wicked. All right. Uh, I want to start actually reading in verse uh, 5. And it goes like this. Um, Woe to you, inhabitants of the seacoast, you nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, land of the Philistines, I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. And you, O seacoast, shall be pastures with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> Woe to you is a... It's a warning that should be heeded because it can be backed up. This isn't some scrawny, stick boy, diary of a wimpy kid standing up. To, it's, it's not that. It, he's not, it's not someone making ludicrous demands like, hey, just wait until one day I'm going to, right? Like my dad used to always tell me, like, to my brother, he's three years older than me. He used to always tell me, like, Nick, you better not pick on your brother because one day he's going to be older than you. And I'm like, yeah. But, but I never was. <laughs> like, I never was older than my brother. Uh, although the trick was that sometimes I would be four years older than him and sometimes I would be three years older. And so, right? So I had this thought that that would be me, right? So this isn't just some ludicrous, scrawny me. This isn't just some, my dad's really tough and just wait, or my brother can beat up your brother. It's, it's, it's not like that on the playground stuff. This is the God of the universe who holds all things together against him. None can stand. He moves the kings of history like water in his hand. He used weak, stumbling, insecure Moses to defeat mighty Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. He flung the stars in the heavens, and he tells the water of the ocean where to stop. And he doesn't like it when he sees his people being treated poorly. He really is the dad who can beat up your dad. So he warns, woe to you. That's like serious warning in ancient talk. Like, it's not like, whoa, this is like, woe to you, right? It's, it's about to happen. It is a warning. Like, take caution. Woe to you, inhabitants of the seacoast. What does that mean? In, in the ancient world, just like today, right, uh, the, the most powerful cities were at seaports, which is obvious for trade and for travel. And, and over time, those cities would become influential because people would go there and then they would go anywhere else and they would be like, hey, did you see what those people were wearing at the seaport, at the seacoast? That was really cool. Like, we should dress like that. And you think, that's dumb. It's the same, it's the same thing today. It's no different. But, but as it relates to this context, it's power because these cities would grow because people would go there and they would say, man, I kind of like it there. Why don't we stay there? Because then we could start a business because there's always people coming in, right? And so they would grow in, in, in governance and power. So the seacoast cities are a big deal. Woe to you. The word of the Lord is against you. I will destroy you and there will be no one left. Ha. How could that be? How could our city be a ghost town, right? The metropolis will be transformed to the shepherd's pasture. That's the image that Zephaniah is rolling with, right? The cities that Zephaniah warns are not like small town USA, but they are the strongest in the greatest, most tenacious empire of the day, the Assyrian Empire. Who, who, we cannot overlook the nature of God's justice, of his judgment, and his warning against those who persist in evil, those who oppress the weak, and those who overtake the humble, those who glory in their sin and delight in their abuse. And God warns the nations of their end, of, of their destruction, that they're spiraling towards this impending doom. There's this line in Top Gun 
or goose. He says we're in a flat spin. We're heading off to sea, right? What that means is it's over. That is our trajectory. There's nothing we can do. You can pull on the thing all that you, you're just falling straight down. That's the end. That's, that's the warning that he's bringing to this. But because the response from God is really an outflow of the nature of God, that is to say this, he acts because he is. He acts because he is. The same warning he sends through Zephaniah to the nations is the same grace that he sends to all who might receive the warning. So if today in this room you find yourself in a place that's opposing God's people, that's opposing God's word, that's opposing God himself, you you are opposing the Lord, and just so you know, you aren't getting away with anything. And that's true for you who who are there, but it's also true for, for those who are not, who see people around them and they say, gosh, why do they win the day? Why is that person who comes against me or comes against the church or comes against uh, Jesus in the name of Jesus or comes against the purity that God invites us to live in or comes against the Lord himself, why do they seem to win, to win the day? It may seem like they are or you are getting away with it. It may appear as if you, you've won the day, but on the day of the Lord, if not sooner, you'll find your land desolate, your possessions plundered, and you will be laid to waste. That's what this is saying. And, and there are two things. That, th- this changes two things, all right? It changes, one, how we respond as opponents of God. So if you are one finding yourself opposing God, and here's the thing, you might say, well, that's not me because, like, I'm a Christian or I'm a part of the church, but, like, there's a lot of unnecessary friendly fire in the world that we live in. There's a lot of people who are in the household of faith taking shots at people in the household of faith. Now, that's not to say that we don't get to uh, call out false teachers and we don't get to make distinctions, but it's also saying that if your job is to wake up and to to blog about other uh, Christians or followers of Jesus who are not doing it right, you should find another job. So, so the two things, how we respond as God's opponents, we get to repent. We get to stop opposing God's people. We get to stop tearing apart his body. We get to heed the warning, and we get to consider his warning in Zephaniah or throughout all of the scriptures. We, we get to consider God's warning that he's saying, you're going to be decimated and destroyed. We get to, we get to hear that as grace upon grace upon grace. Right, Just like uh, a sign that says, hey, the bridge is out up ahead. That's grace. That's not like, hey, they're not going to tell me what to do. Right? I'm a taxpayer. I, I probably paid for that sign. I'm not, okay, you do you, bro. Right? Or, or, or a warning sign that says, do not ingest. Like, you shouldn't eat that little pack that's like in some foods. Like, don't do that. Shouldn't do that. If you do that, you, you, you may die. Or, or do not remove safety guards on saws and, you know, weed eaters and such, right? String trimmers. Sorry, Josh, right? So, so all those things are grace to us, just like this. Stop opposing God's people because you've made an enemy of God. And, and in the chapter, or, or actually the, the beginning of chapter 2, our response to this Seek him humbly. That's what we get to do, right? It, but it also changes how we respond to the opponents of God. So if, if you're not in that category right now, we get to stand up for what's true, and we get to stand up for people who, who are uh, being opposed, and, and that might include ourselves. but because justice flows, we can have a heart for our enemies. It's just really tough can have a heart for our enemies because, because God laid down his life while we were his enemies. And I'll, I'll say this, I, I think it's pretty clear from the teaching of Jesus 
certainly in the New Testament, that it's really easy to love the people that you agree with. But the thing that determines whether you're just being a moralist, that's just doing the things because that's what makes me good and that's okay, and the thing that means that your heart and your mind and your life has been transformed by Jesus, it's the extent that you love the people that are not like you. So you want to self-reflect in light of judgment. We know that, that God is the God who vindicates. And, and vengeance and judgment is in his hands. And if that's true, then what we get to do is we get to do our part. To love those who aren't like us. Now, I'm not saying continue to be in an abusive relationship. You know, like, gosh, you, don't do that. And we get to flesh that stuff out in community. And, gosh, if you're in a situation where you feel conflicted like that, talk to me, talk to someone else. But, but by and large, we, we see an enemy who's uh, opposing or oppressing the church or God's people or you or or. or at work, you don't feel like you can be yourself because of some policy and all those things. And what it does is, or, or, or politics, like they're the bad guys and so we're the good guy. All those things, this changes how we respond as opponents of God and it changes how we respond to opponents of God. The fact that God is warning the wicked. So that's good for justice and justice is bad news for some. But bad news for some has a flip for others. And and while the image may seem like God is some unhinged, deranged lunatic just looking to to wipe out cities of of prominence, what we find is that in his just love for his covenant people, his judgment avenges the affliction of his own. His wrath is against the wicked, but that means that he offers, and this is the second point, he he offers comfort for the afflicted. In life, when, when you have enemies, or when it feels like the sky is falling, or when the world seems like really bleak, and not just the world out there, but like the world like close to home, when you feel alone, when life is just hard, what is the thing that, that so often we want more than anything else? We want someone to be for us. And I don't know if you can recall in your life, like, the impact of being in a difficult situation and somebody just saying, you know what, like, I, I hear you, and, I, and I'm sorry, and I'm for you. But that's, like, super powerful. I see you. I'm with you. I'm for you. I, I remember when we planted the village early on, and it was, like, really tough, and, you know, like... Um, a livelihood on the line in some ways for us and just trying to figure out stuff. And there was a, another pastor friend of mine who was a little further along in church planting. And like, it wasn't overt, but like we would get together regularly and catch up and, and, and he would kind of ask me questions and help me process. And like, I just remember like, it essentially just, whether he said it or not, but what I felt was like, I'm, I'm for you and that band of 17 misfits that you have hanging out together on Sundays. Like, I, I believe in, in God's work through you all because I believe in you all. And I'm just like, like honestly, on, on, on some of those tough days, it was like, that's the, like the only shining light that you have to like, okay, well, at least someone does or whatever, you know, we'll give it another go and write another terrible sermon and preach another, you know, all the things. That's why uh, a teenager can fight with mom and reject her for mothering until life gets real and hard hits come. And then sometimes not until later in life and sometimes it might be too late. But, but we get to a place to where we, we long for mom to wrap her arms around us because uh, this is what I say to my kids. um, You better appreciate your mom because I'm telling you this, 
in all of your life, there might not be anyone else who ever loves you like your mom does. And so I know that's not the experience of everyone, right? But, but there is something uh, about the way a, a good mother loves and, and, and a good parent loves. And so, uh, but even, even if that's true, the, the greater hope of refuge isn't from mom or from, from dad being tough on the playground and like defending our honor. It's, it's not from that. Or that favorite teacher just pulls you aside and says, you know what? I saw you today and it seems like you're struggling a little bit. Hey, I'm for you, right? Today will be a little better, you know, or, or, or tomorrow, you know, is a new day or whatever. Like just that, that little voice of like sensitivity of comfort when we're going through stuff or that, that sister that you have that's just always there or that friend. Like the reality is in this moment we get to, in real life, we get to love those people, right? And if today the Spirit would be reminding you of those people, like, I don't, like right now, if you have Verizon, because otherwise you can't send them messages in this place, but like send them a text right, right now and just pick, hey, thanks, because you're really great, and you really, you really helped me that one time, right? I mean, we get to love them and appreciate them and let them know that, and here's the thing, you get to be them too. You get to look around and you get to say, you know what? Uh, if I have a God who, who comforts me when I'm afflicted, then you know what I get to do? I get to, man, I get to be used by him to comfort people who are being afflicted. In, in maybe in subtle ways, and maybe in much larger ways. But the greater hope is not from any of those relationships. The greater hope is from the Lord. That, that's our greater motivation as well. Here's where we see the heart behind the warning. Throughout the storyline of Scripture, it can be difficult to find the currents under the stream that's kind of moving this plot along. And so we can, uh, we can get so sucked in to just read kind of like one verse or one word, and, and we can forget what's going on in the, in the paragraph and in the chapter and in the book and in the context and in the, the testament or wherever it finds, us, finds itself. But if we observe and if we read slowly and if we take it in chapter and book at a time rather than word and verse, like, like uh, I read the Read Scripture app, and it's really helpful because it's kind of plodding along and there's some pairings of scriptures, but there are videos from the Gospel Project uh, people. And so you can like, I don't know what this is talking about. And then there's a helpful video and it's right there. And so as you're kind of raking along to, to uh, see the story work together, what we see is the Spirit paints a mural that re reflects and reflects uh, ref refracts light into the mural of, of history, past, present, and future. And what we see is this. The fierceness of God's judgment is only matched by the fierceness of his devotion to his people. Justice is bad for those who are receiving judgment. But the flip is we have a just God and, and and the fierceness of his, of his judgment that we see in this text and so many like it, it's only matched by the fierceness of his devotion to his people. It is his devotion to his people that is the fuel for the warning. So we look at this. In, in Zephaniah 2, 7 through 9, it says, The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah. Remember, it's 640 to 609 B.C. And, and the northern kingdom of Israel has already been wiped out. And the judgment is that the, the southern kingdom, Judah, there are just two tribes left and, and the, the capital city, Jerusalem, that they're going to be wiped out. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah on which they shall graze. Right? That's a real flip. Laughable, if not true. For the Lord, their God, will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes. And he goes on, he says, I have heard the taunts of Moab and the revilings of the Ammonites, how they taunted my people, how they've made boast against them. It's a, a much bigger, grander scale of, would you like a snowball sandwich? And what he's saying is, I see you. 
I've heard them. And, and I'm here to do something about it. As I live, declares the Lord, Moab shall become like Sodom. Ammonites like Gomorrah, who, who God destroyed them. And we see in Ezekiel, who's, uh, who's a prophet just after this, he says this of Sodom and Gomorrah. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. Remember, God wiped them off the earth. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease. Dang. I thought you were going to say something else. They had pride, excess of food, so much food they didn't know what to do with it. Gosh. Wow. Prosperous ease. Life is really tough. I know, I know it is. But they did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty, they were arrogant, and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. That's, that's overwhelming justice. In fact, you have Abraham. Before God goes into Sodom and destroys them, he says, God, w- tell me, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? You're not going to do that. Like, you're going to destroy all of them? And God said, that's what I'm going to do. Will you indeed sweep away, sweep away the righteous with the wicked? No, no, no. Well, God, if there were 50 righteous, you won't sweep them away, right? No, I won't. Well, what? What if there are 45? You won't sweep them away, right? You won't destroy the city if there are 45 righteous, right? Nope. 40, all right? What about 40? 35? 30? 10? If there are 10 righteous, you won't sweep them away, right? No. And yet they got swept away. And there's one righteous Lot and his wife, and she almost made it out. In all that, we see the character and the nature of God. And it's tough. Zephaniah goes on, The remnant of my people shall plunder them, and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. He's mindful of his afflicted. He is drawn to action. He moves because he sees, and he sees because he is near. If that's not true, then then what are we doing? He moves because he sees, and he sees because he is near. He is not some far-off God in outer space. He's not some concept in an old, dusty book. The remnant. I mean, I love the picture. Like, you think about documentaries or movies where there's like this line of samurai warrior, and there are... Many of them at one point, but then it reduced down, and then, you know, 300 years later, this, the last samurai, he rises out of the ashes, right? And he brings about a way of life, or, or some knights of the round table deal, and like, they were, and then they, they went underground, and everyone thought they were gone. There, there was none left, just look around, but then they, they show up again. Or some Jedi knights, how about that? All right, the Jedis, they're all gone. Nobody doing that anymore. But uh, there's one last Jedi, Okay. In in the darkest of days throughout the history of God and humanity, he preserves a faithful few. And and sometimes that that swells in revival and it sweeps across nations. And sometimes it's scarce. And you hear stories of St. Patrick preserving Christianity, you know, throughout all of Europe. Him alone. Something to do with snakes and clovers, too. I don't know. But he wasn't a leprechaun, I don't think. We see this remnant scattered from old to new, from small tribes to nations. And the emphasis, when we see these things rightly, they're not on the faithful remnant. They're not on the mighty men and women, although we get to honor them. But they're on a God who preserves his people to persevere. They're on a a God who finishes the good work that he begins. They're on a God who uses the weak to shame the strong. In the immediate fulfillment, there is some historical application here. Babylon in just a few years will come in and they will, uh, Babylon will be brought low. And that would seem laughable if it weren't true. But the scope of Zephaniah, his words reasonably go well beyond the gates of Jerusalem in this time, in this place with these people. And if they are just a thumbnail image of a larger restoration, then we are drawn into its reality, its warning it's hope. 
Isn't that an incredible thought that God sees and he hears? And although it might not seem like it in the moment, he will bring justice to bear because of his great love for you. And the last thing, three ways that God defends and restores destruction of the proud. So it's a warning to the wicked, comfort to the afflicted, and destruction of the proud. Let's read starting in verse 10. This shall be their lot in return for their pride, because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome against them. Not like in a, that's awesome, but like in a awesome way. For he will famish all of the gods of the earth. To him shall bow down each in its place, all the lands of the nation, nations. You also, O Cushites, I think that's like Ethiopia. These are big cities, is what you're going to see. The four biggest in, in, in the ancient world. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. And he will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like the desert. Herds shall lie down in her mists. All kinds of beasts, even the owl and the hedgehog, they're hanging out. Hedgehog's super fast, but you guys already know that. Shall lodge in her capitals. A voice shall hoot in the window. Devastation will be on the threshold, for her cedar work will be laid bare. This is the exultant city that lives securely, that said in her heart, I am and there is no one else. If that isn't pride, I don't know what it is. But look, you know that's not just stuff for nations. That's stuff for me. I am, and there's no one else. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. They're, that's like equivalent of like, making TikTok dances at her expense. <clears throat> Maybe you would say, gosh, isn't the destruction of the proud the same as a warning to the wicked? And I would say, no. And, and here's why. If God merely warned and he didn't act, then he, then he isn't good. He isn't consistent. Right? And if he didn't warn but merely acted then I don't know what he is. Maybe unjust, all right? But God is not merely one of talk, but of action. And what this says, like my family, we're, we're going to New York in just a couple weeks. I've not been there. I hear it's pr a pretty big city. Um, imagine Times Square, and I think there's a bunch of stuff there, and it's like a lot going on, and there's uh, uh, cedar, marble, concrete, LEDs, all kinds of stuff. And what this is saying is, that's going to be a nature preserve. And you'd say, no, no, we're too powerful for that. There's no way. And that's, that's, what, that's what the destruction of the proud from the Lord is going to bring. And all of the ways God invites his people to be his, the most essential response is humility. That is to say, when we know and when we trust and when we treasure God in fullness, we must behold this truth that he must increase and I must decrease. His, his promise is that he won't reject the humble. And what, as we get older, what we begin to learn, and as we spend time with this book, is that is the way of everlasting life. And not only everlasting in the future, but that is the way of the fullness of life today. And, we, and, and the opposite is true, right? Those who are proud and oppress his people will surely be brought low. And so we read in, the, in Proverbs, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 
Imagine someone saying that New York and L.A. and Chicago and Philadelphia and Miami or whatever would have herds of animals running through them, even owls and hedgehogs in their capital buildings. All the pillars and all the metal and marble and cedar and mahogany and glass and, and concrete, all of it will be brought to nothing. All her power has become a den for wild beasts, the laughing stock of civilization. And this is not because God is bad, but this is because God is good. Maybe we can think of it this way. Like, I remember probably some Earth Day hearing something about, like, literally one drop of oil decimates acres of swimming pools of in endless amounts of fresh water, right? Like, a drop of oil and... It's, it's a wrap. It's over, right? Um, and I assume that's true, right? Um, I'm not minimizing that fact that I learned on some Earth Day, okay? But if you see that to be true, we see that that one drop of oil pollutes all of those things. We see that show up in our life and in our interaction with God, all right? And, and here's how. If, if we break the law in one place... We learn this, that we are, we are law-breaking sinners deserving of death, hell, judgment, and, and that sweeps the earth, not without warning. And the darkness of mankind grows to consume every part and every heart of creation. That one drop of oil, that one drop of sin pollutes all creation. And what we see is in the beginning of this book, in the beginning of our story with God and man, Adam, he's good briefly. <clears throat> in the first Adam, he rebels and he sins and he brings death upon all through one man because he sinned and he brings sin upon all of us and it expands endlessly throughout creation. This kind of dark cloud without and, and uh, above us and we see it in God's response here in judgment to Judah through Zephaniah. And we join the story of God here, filled with the blood of the first Adam, stained, broken, and sinful. God shows a better way to be brought near. And, and throughout the Old Testament, we see his law show up. And, and you are my covenant people, so live this way. Like, I am it let me be at the top but, and walk in my ways. Walk with me. Walk in my ways time and time again. Yet the law only seems to reveal the true nature of mankind, that we are depraved and we are broken. And that shows up in what we worship. We were made to worship one thing, the one true living God, broken by sin's work. It shows up in the way that we relate upward and outward. Like, our relationship with God is broken. Our relationship with one another is broken. Our relationship to creation is broken. It shows up in the way that we work and the way that we live and the way that we play in all of the ways. Yet God always has an eye on preservation through a remnant of faith, even in the darkest time of humanity, a faint flicker glows. The faithful remnant. It all, in the storyline of, of our history with God, it all reduces all the way down to one. Not one nation, not one city, not one neighborhood, not even one household, but one person. The hope of goodness, the hope of justice, the hope of God, the hope of love and kindness, the hope of community, the hope of promises about God and his people. It all falls on the shoulders of one who, if he fails, brings ruin to everything. But one single human who is the son of God, he was sent and he willingly came to rescue his people, to save them from sin within and to sin, save them from sin without the lone remnant of righteousness in a world destined for judgment. And his name was Jesus. 
and he remained faithful to the Father and to the covenant that God has promised with all who would believe. And it is Jesus alone in the sea of darkness among generations of failure to please God. It is the precious blood of Jesus, the second new, better, and final Adam who succeeds where the first Adam failed, who succeeds where we fail, who satisfies where our sin fails. He hears cries. He sees affliction. He is mindful of the remnant of faith. And it is this Jesus who lays down his life to offer the outcasts a seat at his table. Though this world be against you, I'm for you. And beyond that, while the proud bullies will pay for their own sin, Jesus even offers to pay the judgment on the cross for them if they would humble themselves. And he even invites them to sit at the lunchroom table of the new heavens and the new earth. For now, for all eternity, not as one to be feared, but as one to point to the great depth of grace and love and justice and mercy. The remnant is brought to one faithful. And from there, we see throughout this book, we see then it explodes forth going as wide as the Spirit would allow. So we are brought into the remnant of the household of faith by the finished, complete, faithful work of Jesus. We are brought into the household of God. God defends and restores the remnant of the household of faith. And because that's true, we have a great defender and restorer. And we get to then walk and do the same thing. We get to defend and restore where we are able with all of the resources that God has given us and with all the experience that he's given us and with all the gifts that he's given us, with everything that he's given us. We get to do this work for love, for justice, for God's glory, for the fullness of, of life and joy together today, and forever. And that's good news. The band can come up. We get to respond. We get to pray. We get to ask God to search our hearts, right? And, and to see where we're neglecting warnings that he has for us, where we're not mindful that he sees and he hears and he cares and he does something about it can sit right where you are, can stand up and sing. There's a prayer bench over there. If you would like to pray by yourself, there will be someone back by that red tree over there. We're back uh, at the end of this aisle. We would love to pray with you. If you are in the household of faith, that is, you trust Jesus, then we offer you this, this seat at the table, a meal in his name, body broken, representing, represented by the bread, and blood spilt, represented by the cup. We invite you to take that. If you're not a part of God's family, don't do that. That's not for you, but we would love to chat with you about what that looks like. God, thank you for these people, for this day, for, for the grace of your warning, for the truth of your judgment, for the perseverance of your love. God, would you let us see you uh, in, in your fullness today. Would you reshape our minds and hearts and conform them to your will, conform them to your ways? God, would you let us be a community that loves so well? Would you let us be a community that walks in justice because you walk in justice? Would you let us trust that you are the God of vengeance and that's not ours, but that is yours and it is sure we love you and we need you in Jesus' name. Amen.